anyone can enhance how they experience the natural world by generating memories, knowledge, and ideas through drawing and writing in journals. Today, we join author, educator, historian, and journal painter, James McElhenney, who will lead this five-part series of workshops and lectures inspired by the exhibition, Landscape Art and Virtual Travel, highlights from the collections of the Hudson River Museum and Art Bridges. Over the course of the next few months, we'll be visiting sites that resonate with the collections of the Hudson River Museum, and participants are invited to develop their skills from mindful traveling through journaling. While the artist has developed a progressive curriculum that provides a thorough introduction to a host of ideas about drawing, watercolor, and the field of plein air painting, you are invited to join any or all of the five sessions. In terms of art materials, you can use anything that makes a mark and any surface that takes a mark will be perfectly suitable. You can certainly consult the extensive list of tools and resources for optional supplies, which will be accessible on the Hudson River Museum website and which will be uh, listed in the chat. So we'll be doing that shortly for you. Uh, let's see, well, today is part one, the introductory lecture in which we are gonna learn about journalism, about journaling and expeditionary art, tools and materials, and have an opportunity to engage in Q&A with the artist at various points during the program. Please note that your microphones have been muted upon entry, though you can control your video camera. You can also use the live transcript closed captioning option in English at the bottom of your screen, which is provided through artificial intelligence by Zoom. Should you have questions, comments, or concerns, we encourage you to type them in the chat throughout the course of the conversation, and the artist will be responding throughout the program which we anticipate will run about 90 minutes. Now, it is my honor to introduce James Lancel McElhenney, visual artist, author, independent scholar, and fine press publisher. He holds an MFA in painting from Yale and a BFA from the Tyler School of Art. McElhenney is the recipient of fellowships and grants, including a 2017 Pollock Krasner grant and a prior visual artist fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. McElhenney is the author of Sketchbook Traveler, Hudson Valley, the first in a series of books produced by Schiffer Publishing. His work was recently exhibited, and you may well have seen it, in James McElhenney, Discover the Hudson Anew at the Hudson River Museum. And his work may be found here at the Hudson River Museum and in numerous public collections, including the Albany Institute of History and Art, the West Point Museum, and New York Public Library. You can also visit his website, which we will put in the chat. It's www.mackelpennyart.com. So as I mentioned, this will be the first of five sequential workshops. We hope that you will join us for the second installment on May 19th to be followed on Wednesdays, June 5th, July 8th, and August 4th, when there will be a final critique. And now I turn the program over to James. Thank you, Sarah Linda. That was a wonderful introduction. And uh, as you can see, I'm blushing. <laughs> uh, it will be my pleasure to start this program by unpacking of the practice of expeditionary journal painting and, and an attempt to uh, insert it into the canon as one of the uh, as one of the undergirdings of uh, the American landscape uh, tradition, including Hudson River School and uh, its later iterations. So, without further ado, I'm going to screen share and uh, and we're going to present the lecture. And as Sarah Linda said, uh, please any questions you have, please enter them into the chat. We're going to have a uh, a brief Q and A after this short slide talk, and uh, I'll I'll address any of your questions then. Okay, slideshow. All right.
The oldest narratives in human history are stories of travel from Gilgamesh and the Odyssey to the Canterbury Tales. In this series of workshops, we'll concentrate on the practice of drawing, painting, and writing in journals without confining ourselves only to those techniques and approaches of interest to professional and amateur artists. Casting a wider net, we will explore concepts and practices that anyone can use to get more out of their personal experiences. In his travelogue, The Innocence Abroad, Mark Twain observed that, quote, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one's little corner of the earth all one's lifetime, end quote. People have always been on the move. Perhaps the most notable traveler artist of the early modern period was the peripatetic Albrecht Dürer. He was one of the first European artists to treat landscape as a primary subject and not just as a backdrop. The techniques he employed established the, uh, the underpinnings for 300 years of watercolor painting. You see on the right, uh, uh, a landscape, I believe it's a German landscape in, near his Nür Nuremberg home. And to the left, we see a silver point drawing from his uh, a Netherlandish sketchbook. Ink painting had, had existed for a thousand years in the Far East where the codex book form is said to have been invented. Islamic miniaturists and Medieval European illuminators laid the groundwork for painting in books. Durer simply expanded that tradition. A light drawing in ink or perhaps graphite would be elaborated with color. Usually these would be powdered pigments ground with gum Arabic, such as were used here uh, by the naturalist Jacques Lemoyne de Morgue who traveled to Florida in the 16, uh, 1660s. Botany, you may not know, or you may know, was practiced less as pure science than as a search for new medicinal species and for decorative plants to be used as garden ornaments and novel subjects for embroidery. Scientific and topographical art employed the technique of tinted graphite drawings. Pardon. As did scenic views by professional artists. John White traveled to what is now North Carolina where he recorded the appearance and life ways of the indigenous peoples. See, these are in the collection of the British Museum and they're done uh, simply a graphite drawing that's been, that's been uh, elaborated with color. Franz Post and later in the 17th century, Sibylla Marion documented the flora and fauna of South America. You see, this is a sketchbook page on the left of an anteater and uh, a view of a river on the right with a capybara and, and very specific in terms of, of uh, the, uh, the zoological and the botanical content. Following the French and Indian War, you know, the British public clamored for images of North America. As we see this view of the Palisades by Thomas Pownall, who was the governor of Massachusetts. Um, topographical drawings done on the spot by military officers like Thomas Pownall here were elab elaborated by professional artists like Paul Sandby as engravings and published to popular acclaim. The military topographical tradition developed 
methods for working in watercolor and graphite that abridged a gap between cartography and picture making. See here uh, a drawing by Paul Sandby of, of a survey in Scotland. Artillery officer and late later general Thomas Davies was the first European to de depict Niagara Falls from observation. William Bartram and his fellow naturalists cultivated artistic approaches to their depiction of botanical species and animals. The British topographical tradition was further refined by officers serving in India. Many images like this were produced, not by professional artists, but by professional soldiers. It was believed by the, you know, the British military that if cadets uh, trained in map making and choreographic picture making could, be, could learn these skills in an artistic way, it would make them keener observers. A thought which I think uh, is wonderful. <clears throat> the practices these military topographical artists develop were adopted by civilians. Uh, who were on the move uh, on the grand tour of Europe uh, in search of the picturesque. Here we have four images from the humorous illustrations, or the illustrations of a humorous poem called The Tour of Dr. Syntax in Search of the Picturesque. And you see a sort of quixotic scientist intellectual who is being uh, who is being confounded at every turn by farm animals and slippery rocks and other things. So on a more serious note, uh, after the Prussian intellectual Alexander von Humboldt gambled his experience on a self-funded scientific tour of Venezuela and the Andes, his findings would shape scientific thinking for more than half a century. Because he had to produce his own drawings and diagrams, when he met with Thomas Jefferson, he advised him to embed artists and naturalists in military exploring expeditions. Here we see a sketchbook by Titian Ramsey Peel II, who was the son of Charles Wilson Peel. Uh, he accompanied expeditions across the Great Plains of the Rockies and by sea to Antarctica, the South Pacific, and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, not as well known as his father, his contributions to knowledge and science were considerable. Around the same time, we see the professional artists uh, like Eugène Delacroix uh, <clears throat> adopting expeditionary sketchbook journaling for his travels to the Maghreb, where, where time spent in Algeria and Morocco forever changed his art. These are wonderful pages where he's combining writing and, and picturing together. As a cadet at West Point, General Seth Eastman received a training in drawing that was modeled in part on the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich. Recalled to West Point after the death of his teacher, Thomas Gimbreed, Eastman briefly oversaw the Academy's drawing program. Assigned to various posts from Washington, DC to Minnesota and Texas, Eastman's drawings filled numerous sketchbooks. Of course, we all recognize the building on the left, I think. Anyone here from Texas? I am. That's the Alamo, right? So Native American warriors imprisoned by the army at Fort 
Marion in St. Augustine, Florida, were given these like ledger books and colored pencils as a way to occupy their minds and to pass the time that separated them from their homelands and families. What they produced was a collective elegy to a culture targeted for genocide, a memorial to brave deeds and lost lives. And if you haven't seen these, they're really quite remarkable. The, uh, there are a number of them in the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC. And I believe also occasionally on view at the Customs House down at the Battery at, at the southern tip of Manhattan. Now the Grand Tour tradition continued uh, into the 20th century in, uh, in works, uh, well here before we come to that, here is a sketchbook of Edward Adrian Wilson who died with Robert Falcon Scott uh, on the Antarctica expedition. And he was found frozen to death, but all of his sketches and drawings and watercolors were preserved. So I um, should also add, there's a wonderful art book called Explorer's Sketchbooks by uh, Chronicle Press out in San Francisco, and I highly recommend it. So uh, talking about how this practice continued into the 20th century, we have here uh, a couple of travel drawings by the late John Brinkerhoff Jackson, uh, who is the preeminent considered to be the father of American landscape theory. And um, of course, Hockney, who uh, has filled many, many sketchbooks with wonderful paintings and, and working across the page spread like this, I think is, is wonderful because it, it, it creates a diptych um, and it creates a whole thought you can hold in your hand. We have uh, also artists like Mark Dion, uh, who ray traced the travels of uh, William Bartram through the American South. And we have Charles Ritchie, uh, who is, does these marvelous sketchbooks and journals combining images and writing. Uh, and this is basically exploring his suburban Maryland Beltway neighborhood. Then also another artist, uh, I don't have a slide of her work, but I'd encourage you to look her up named Jean McKay, who, who, um, who writes books for young readers that helps them make the connection between art and science. I highly recommend those. And then of course, my own efforts. Here, this is Rondout Creek near High Falls. Again, using the page spread as a diptych format. And uh, this being a, a monochromatic painting uh, or in contrast to this, which is not monochromatic. Um, and then here also, which combines map of the prior location. See this little spot up here in the right hand corner. That's where I'm standing when I did this. So um, it seemed to me at the time I needed a map and, and the frame on the right is um, a kind of interpretive copy of the same view by Sanford Robinson Gifford of course, who's taking great liberties with, with the geography and, and you know, adjusting the position of mountains to, uh, uh, to help the composition. So rather than promoting a single artistic practice style or ideology, my goal and my goal here today and for the next four workshops is uh, to unpack ways that we can use drawing and writing as portal and pathways that connect art with history, science, and literature, 
celebrate curiosity, uh, promote environmental awareness, and foster economic civics, pardon me, ecological civics in ways that, that are accessible to everyone. Uh, we can take some questions now, if you like. Ah, questions. Yes, we do have some questions. Oh, good. Well, let's just, hear them. Just a couple, James. We heard from, uh, from Ranju early on. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Um, with reference to John White's graphic drawings. Yes. You could elaborate a little bit on um, the color, the application of color, uh, what kind of paint possibly, uh, whatever light you can shed on, on that. Let me go back into the, uh, into the, uh, into the, see if I can return to that image. All right, so these, uh, as you all may know, John White was at first the gentleman artist on Sir Richard Grenville's expedition to uh, Virginia, which was then North Carolina, what's now the island of Roanoke, and established what later became known as the Lost Colony. And uh, later John White returned as the governor <laughs> and uh, went back to England to get more supplies, but the uh, it was at the same time that that England was dealing with the Spanish Armada, so his return was delayed by a couple of years. And when he came back, all he found was the word Croatan carved on a tree trunk, and everyone had left. No one, there were no bodies, no sign of violence. It's just everyone picked up and left. And he never was able to determine where they went. But during his time there, he did produce many, many of these drawings, which I guess you could say they're ethnographic, uh, or that would be sort of a, a, you know, the colonialist view. But um, uh, the pigments would have been basically earth pigments, because the pigments we have today are um, were mostly developed during the 19th century as a result of uh, uh, industry. They were chemical byproducts and sometimes, uh, you know, colors that were generated chemically from heavy metals. And the majority of pigments that John White would have been using would have been either organic, as in, you know, powdered flowers or uh, you know, the plant material or uh, earth, earthen colors like ochre or possibly uh, iron and lead, which can produce shades of red and yellow. And, um, and usually the black, if there is any, or the blue, if there is any blue, is really more or less a, uh, a contextual use of black using black or gray in relationship to other colors to make it look like a, like a cool color. Um, I don't know, does that answer your question? And the graphite, of course, was, was widely available. It was, it's, it's a mineral, you know, it's mined. And so, uh, you know, a person at that time would have been, would have had sticks, uh, that would have been held in a brass holder called a port crayon. Um, it wouldn't be until the 19th century that that we, that anyone invented a pencil uh, inside a wooden stick. So prior to that time, there would have been a like a mechanical pencil. It would it was it was a bronze tube with uh, at either end there would be two rings. It would be split, and uh, you would use the tension to hold the stick in place and and. Uh, yeah, we can talk about that later, too. Does that answer your question? Hi, James. Um, I think from what I see, that does. We did also have a question from Elizabeth um, asking about, um, could you repeat the last sentence in the talk about what ideas you want to connect with this workshop? Oh, sure. 
Um, well, I'll stop the screen share. So here's the thing. People uh, sometimes figure out where my camera is. Uh, people sometimes like look at my work and, and assume that I am uh, somehow aligned with uh, some schools of thought or polemics of style regarding representation versus say abstraction. Nothing could be further from my mind. I'm not, I'm not the least bit interested in those issues. And uh, I'm more intrigued by how um, drawing lets us um, mine information for poetry and knowledge and not uh, to try to champion one style or one technique over another. I use watercolor simply for the fact that, because of the fact that it's, it's portable and it dries quickly and I can paint in books. When I was painting uh, on plein air with, uh, on canvas with oil paint, it was a lot of uh, struggling to get from, from one place to another and actually limited my mobility. If I, if I was inclined to paint on a mountaintop, it was quite a chore to get everything up there and then try to get the wet canvases back down to the car without, uh, without encountering swarms of mosquitoes or having the surface scraped by leaves or branches along the, uh, you know, along the trail down the mountain. But uh, with watercolor, I can just simply paint in a book. I can open the book, uh, I can paint in it, and then I can close it and then stick it in my pocket and I'm done. So <clears throat> that, that was inspired by what I learned about expeditionary art and, uh, and as a consequence of that, I, I became excited in, uh, about, uh, about pursuing that as, as an artistic practice. Also translating it into prints and books and other things. So, but <clears throat> my, my closing comments were that rather than promoting a single artistic practice style or ideology, which I just addressed, my goal is to use drawing and writing as, as a, a way to connect history, science, and literature, and my own personal experience, and to turn, turn experiences into knowledge and ideas. And to do that in a way that promotes environmental awareness, ecological civics, you know, sustainability, um, uh, and, um, and like a personal improvement, you know, it's, it's, in, we're in a distracted age. People are constantly looking at their phones, you know, and, and uh, like checking who said what about them on social media. Uh, and what we really need to do is, at least my opinion is, we need to slow down and pay attention. Drawing and writing, if travel, as Mark Twain suggests, is, is, uh, is a way to broaden our thinking, I think he's right, uh, then I think we need a practice that goes beyond simply hopping out of the car at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, taking a few snapshots before heading for the Eltovar Lodge Bar. And, uh, you know, it's more than just a bucket list sort of tourist thing to do. You're actually um, engaging with your surroundings. You're actually slowing down, paying attention. I think that more than whatever the result artistically may be is, is what's important. And many, many people may not have any artistic ambition at all. They may think, well, um, why, should I, why should I be drawing? Um, I said, why do you play tennis? I say, well, it keeps me fit and so forth. I said, but you're never going to make it to, you're never going to make it to Wimbledon. Why bother? You know, I think that the argument here is that, um, that you're going to get something out of it. You're going to get more out of your experience by doing this than by not doing it. It's, 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 
a mindful mode of engagement. I mean, it's sort of like yoga or Tai Chi or um, bird watching or hunting or fishing or whatever it is that you do, you know, that, that what brings you out into nature and connects you to it. James, thank you. Remember when we had the mindfulness chair? I thought up? that was a brilliant idea. I wish I had a picture of that. <laughs> no, Sarah Linda, seriously, send me a picture of the mindfulness chair. I think I've got somebody, I've got a photograph of it, but but the person is asleep in it. <laughs> well, no, that person was just meditating <laughs> with his eyes closed. Well, I've got a picture of Peter Trippy in it. Oh, and he's perfect. not meditating. That was just just for the audience in case they didn't know during James's um, exhibition here. Um, oh God, year and a half ago, we did have uh, a big camp chair that we called our mindfulness chair, which we moved around uh, and set it in front of various works of art in the galleries, uh, along with poetry books and sketching materials and other um, objects that would help one to to focus and it's very much it's kind of it's a different kind of exercise i think here's people, and there is drawing and painting right. you know, and people um, used it and and if i'm not mistaken didn't it like migrate around the museum that yeah. one day it would be here and one day it would be there yes yes so yes. sort of had a mind that, yeah, we've had it in your, we had it in Janelle Lynch's uh, works, we had it in your works, and we had wonderful, you know, wonderful results from people um, and uh, who really got a chance to sit and, and meditate um, on nature. I think um, we have a bunch, a bunch more questions though. Can, okay, uh, let's, let's go, let's, let's do it for, for another, let's do another like two or three questions. I'll okay, try. well, they keep on coming. One one was uh, a question about, um, let's see, the author of the book uh, for young people about uh, the connections between art and science. Somebody just wanted to be- Jean, Jean J-E-A-N McKay, M-A-C-K-A-Y. Ah, uh, Jean McKay. Okay. And she's so, also she's also involved with the Erie Canal. So I mean, she's an interesting, interesting artist, interesting person. I think uh, interesting uh, and useful work. I mean, about journaling, but really, I mean, I think uh, a lot of her audience are young readers, and I think that's a that's terrific, you know, because you can get people thinking about this stuff. Um, okay. early, not wait until they're uh, heading off to elder hostels and so forth. <laughs> thank you, James. Thank you, James, and thank you, oh, Lynn, good. also. Okay, now Ronan uh, had a number of questions about materials and art supplies, which I know you are gonna get into later. Yes. So hold that thought, Ronan, and then if you still have questions at the end to ask James, um, they would be more than welcome. But um, Ronan did ask about painting in the Adirondacks, um, if that, uh, looking down at Lake Placid, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. You had any comments about, uh, about expeditions in that direction? I'm hoping, I mean, one of the places I'd like, I think they're opening up Whiteface, they're opening up the summit of Whiteface on May 21st, I think. And so I'm with with luck, Lord will and the creek don't rise. Mm -hmm. One of these workshops will be able to do up there because guess what? They've got cell towers up there, so I can get a hot spot going. <laughs> and, and seriously, and yeah. I can bring up my Jackery, you know, uh, you know, power pack, and I'll be all set. But uh, um, yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of locations in the Adirondacks that that are obviously a gobsmackingly beautiful but at the same time um uh they're not all they're not all accessible but certainly a lot are and uh you know just to share i'm talking to some of the hotels and you know resorts that have have occupied some of these terrific uh, these terrific prospects to see if we can put work together in some way so um but Ronan, I think uh, I think we may have met before, and if so, I think you know how to get in touch with me. So please feel free to do so um, uh, on your own too. 
Um, so um, there's a, a question from Molly um, uh, about if you could talk a little about Jackson's American landscape theory. Well, that's a big conversation, probably a mm. whole other program. But um, uh, like J.B. Jackson, let me see if I have the book here. Um, this book is the book to read. It's called Discovering the Vernacular Landscape Yale Press. And it's a terrific introduction to um, landscape theory. This, this is... This is a book that is known to all landscape architects, all historic preservationists, all urbanists, all transportation engineers, and hardly any landscape painters, inexplicably. So uh, basically his central thought, which, which he unpacks in, in, uh, in an essay in the book about the word landscape is, that landscapes are landscapes do not occur in nature, but are created when people adapt terrain to their use. Thus, the landscape is not what you behold, but how you behold it. In other words, the landscape is always a human invention. It's uh, us projecting our desires onto what is beheld. And so, uh, I discovered him when I was painting battlefields of the Civil War back in the 90s as they were being transformed into housing tracks and shopping malls. And I saw the idea of like a battlefields as a piquant a metaphor for why the American landscape is a quarrel about what it is. And as we can see now, and uh, in like a recent history, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of like rancor over how public lands ought to be used. So, um, thank you, James. Uh, we did have one question. You mentioned a landscape book, uh, and if you could just repeat the full title for us. Uh, what the book I held up? Yes. It's called "Discovering the Vernacular Landscape." Thank John you. Brinkerhoff Jackson. John J.B. Jackson, John Brickerhoff Jackson, Yale University Press. And uh, this is the cover. It's backwards. Backwards, yeah. Discovering the Vernacular Landscape. Discovering the Vernacular Landscape. Terrific book. I'll yeah. write that title in the chat. Thank yeah, you, Olivia. So James, uh, do you think this is a good place to take a, br a bit of a break? Yeah, let's take a couple of minutes and then I'll return and I will uh, explore what one might want to take to the field in terms of uh, equipment and gear and so forth. Okay, so if everyone would like to take a two minute break um, uh, for whatever necessary purpose, we'll be starting uh, the next part of the uh, of the program in just a couple minutes. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to screen share the next show, the next PowerPoint. Okay. So Olivia, when we uh, when when you want when you want to return, just give me a yeah. shout. I will. I will. Um, I think Sarah Linda will give us a go ahead in about like two or three minutes. Right. Yes, and please continue to to uh, to chat away here with questions and comments. Thank you all. Yeah, if anybody ha if anybody's still on the Zoom and wants to wants to pose a question, please feel free. 
Someone was mentioning uh, Harriman State Park, which I think you were talking about um, on, during a rehearsal call. Um, yeah, great place. Loads of loads to see. And uh, uh, actually the whole, um, the long path and uh, Storm King Mountain and all of that is, is terrific and accessible yeah. through there. So uh, you got to be careful though, near West Point, you don't want to stray onto government property. You might end up. I don't know how good that would be. <laughs> I, I, when I lived in Virginia, uh, I was painting near Williamsburg and, and, uh, and this like farmer came up to me and he said that uh, I should be careful. I said, why? He said, because just over yonder, he said, that's, 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 the, the, that's the farm over there. I said, what farm is that? I said, aren't you a farmer? He said, no, not my kind of farm. Camp Perry CIA training center. And he said he knew somebody who wounded a deer and tried to follow it onto the CIA training camp and he disappeared for a few months. <laughs> well, that's terrifying. <laughs> he, was, he wanted to make sure he wasn't up to any mischief and didn't see anything he shouldn't have seen. So. Uh, that makes sense. It, yeah. But they call it locally, it's called the farm. I think that's pretty funny. Camp yeah, Perry. I think that's funny as well. <laughs> that's, that's a great name. <laughs> Maybe a, I better be quiet or else uh, I'm going to see a black SUV out in front of my house. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking of good places, um, you know, somewhere where you've also been uh, had an exhibition as well, right? Or at least did some workshops, Olana, right? Oh, Olana. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, such great views up there. Well, there's so so many terrific places to visit, and a lot of people don't know, especially people who are in the city. I mean, even the city, there are wonderful parks. Our place uh, is at the northern end of Manhattan, and uh, Fort Tryon Park and the Cloisters, Inwood Hill. You know, mm -hmm. it's just it's it's very wild. I even saw a rattlesnake there one day mm -hmm. in the city. That's crazy. No, it's great. I'm yeah, glad. no, it's cool. Um, um, we did get a question. Um, was landscape drawing slash painting part of education for the elite in early USA or for general public schools? Uh, you know that answer? Specifically landscape drawing and painting was, was the way most artists learned uh, about landscape painting was through engravings because there were no museums. Until the early 1800s, there were no museums. So here's a funny thing, actually, the Cenografia Americana, which published draw landscape drawings done on the spot by, by you know, the British military officers like Thomas Palinol and Thomas Davies and so forth, was published 10 years before Claude Lorraine's Liber Veritatis. Wow. So the only people who could have seen the Claude, you know, composition book would have been people who were friends with the Duke of Devonshire, who owned it. So it wasn't until the 1770s that it was actually published. So actually, the, you know, you know, the British public saw images of North America before they saw Claude's Liber Veritatis, which kind of upends what everybody assumes about art history that you know Claude was in the was in the 17th century. So. Um, he must have influenced everyone at that time and afterwards. And the reason why he did create the Libra was because he was so influential that all sorts of hacks were copying his work and trying to pass it off as his. And so he did a catalog of his own original compositions, a uh, kind of living catalog resume to uh, authenticate his work. And uh, this was later pur purchased by the Cavendish family do you know it uh you know dukes of devonshire and and um and uh i forget which of them the sixth duke who was a young sort of open-minded fellow uh agreed to have it published and uh it went through numerous editions and was in, enormously influential but not during claude's lifetime or immediately afterwards so it's it's a bit of art historical trivia, yeah. but but um, 
you know, it's interesting to think about it because we assume, well, yeah, they must have, you know, you go to the museum, you see artwork. Well, no, you couldn't go to the museum. There were no museums. And so yeah. a lot of this, if you didn't know uh, an aristocrat with a chateau or a great house, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't get to see original paintings. And uh, so most people relied on engravings. So what they would do would be copy the engravings. They would work from the engravings. Uh, but to answer the question directly about where were the educated elites, well, uh, I think, yes, the educated elites were the ones who were going on the grand tour, you know, which was a chance for young people to sow their wild oats and acquire some culture at the same time. But that keeping a sketchbook was part was and a journal was part of the experience. But um, in terms of education, uh, landscape drawing per se was not taught everywhere, but there was a basic curriculum of drawing that was taught side by side with penmanship. And here's the other thing that people don't realize that a working person might, might be able to read a book they might be able to read print, but they couldn't read longhand. So by teaching everyone how to write in, in a cursive longhand, it meant the working man could read the master's handwriting. And so it was, it was a way of like leveling the playing field a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, that was uh, like Rembrandt Peel. And uh, of course there were others, I mean, Horace Mann called uh, drawing a, a, a moral force. And I think that was why. He said it improved penmanship and was an essential industrial skill. And today, of course, it's only artists who are taught drawing. I think it's a terrible, it's like only teaching English to people who want to be, be, be authors, poets, literary figures. No, I agree. Um, we also, sort of on that subject, this is more of a question for uh, us museum workers, Sarah Linda, but um, Ranju was wondering whether or what, what kind of materials would uh, be allowed in a museum to, to sketch. Um, and it's usually like pencil, pen, anything that's not going to really make a mess. Am I, right. Is that right? It's not going to make a mark, but I, I've been, I guess um, my Deportment must inspire great confidence in museum guards because they've let me bring out a, a watercolor box and and elaborate drawings in the galleries too. Because they, even when I went to the Sistine Chapel, you know, last time I went to Sistine Chapel, you know, this is a lumbering herd moving through and the rising din and the guards say screaming silencio. So when Kathy and I walked in. I stopped and I started drawing and the guard looked over my shoulder. Then he like, like went like this, nodding to a couple of chairs. So we went and sat down and I sat there and drew for an hour while everybody passed by. So I think it, it, it's also how you conduct yourself, but technically it's like when you go to a library or you go, um, you know, look at drawings in a museum and you want to take notes, you're not allowed to bring a pen, only pencil. And often they have little like golf pencils that they'll issue you. I know that's true in the Library of Congress and New York Public and, and you know, other places I've been. So James, I think it's time to get back since okay. we have till three o'clock. I think we need to get well, back on schedule here and go into the next portion of our program. Okay, let me get to my, uh, okay. hold on a minute. Let me get to my, uh, okay. Getting, all right, screen share. All right, so field gear. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road, as they say. So, um, you know, how do we get started? How do we get equipped? And what do we do uh, when we're going outdoors? Now, I don't know. I presume many people on this Zoom are people who like to hike, jog, canoe, go camping, uh, 
hunt fish ski like like you know like whatever it is that you do you have some sense of what to do when you're outdoors it's the same it's the same with journal painting so here i am this this image which is the signature image of the series uh i'm painting at sunset rock overlooking north south lake in the um front escarpment of the uh catskill mountains it's right near um uh haynes falls new york and you can hike up to the top of this rocky platform where thomas cole and sanford gifford and others worked and, and i've uh, made the trek many times and i highly recommend it Okay, so I'm going to talk a little about historic, the historic sketchbook travelers. Bear in mind, these artists like Fidelia Bridges, and here we have we have uh, Kensett and Champney, and uh, uh, over here on the right we've got Carl Bodmer, um, and Prince Maximilian von Wied Neuwied, uh, who went out west, and of course you know Bodmer's famous paintings of. Native Americans. And uh, uh, so you can see they're basically dressed uh, for the field, you know, whatever it was people would wear to go hunting or camping or hiking. That's what they were wearing. Actually, speaking of the Adirondacks, the woman on the left, Fidelia Bridges, actually did make the trek from Newcomb through Indian Pass to North Elba and then climbed whiteface with, with a female companion, unaccompanied by any men. So uh, it, it was, you know, people were getting around more than, than we think. Um, but, but you can see she's wearing a, 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 an interesting costume, which is called a reform dress, if anybody knows what that is. It's a, it was invented by Amelia Bloomer as something, uh, as, as being sort of the uniform of, uh, women's rights and suffrage in the 1850s it remained a it remained a fashion for a while whereas all of these guys this guy's wearing a hunting frock and a wide hat and this is actually an army surplus like leather cap that folds up so it's interesting to look at these old images to see how artists were accoutering themselves here is the is a vitrine from um uh, an exhibition I was in at Boscobel House and Gardens in Garrison, New York. And this is sort of a collection of some of the art materials, some of the drawing materials that people would have carried. And here's a pair of spectacles, a musette, a, a leather bag, a drafting set ruler, pen, open sketchbook uh, with a port crayon in the corner of it. I spoke about that before, an ink horn, a watercolor box. Now these are, are, some of them are original, some of them are like reproductions. And you can't see this thing under here. Okay, here you go. So, and here we have Turner's watercolor wallet at the, at the, at the Tate, which was basically just a piece of leather with a piece of burlap. And he would put the colors onto the burlap and one side was unpainted, one side was Japan. So it acted as a mixing surface. And here is a reproduction of it that I had made. Here on the right, we see an interesting thing, which is called uh, an ink horn or a penner, which was actually a piece of cow horn that was carved into um, an ink well, uh, a container for sand. As you know, sand would have been used as a blotting material. And then here's the cap you see on the right, the whole thing assembled. Um, and this could be put in your pocket. If you know anything about 19th century clothing, male or female, you know, with a coat, the, the, the pockets were, were often in the skirts and they were sort of long, like vertical pockets. So, so an object like we see here would have been carried upright and uh, easily removed and opened up so, so the, uh, the owner could write or draw. Boots. So these are all the shoes that I own. So that's why I've got them up here. And, and I think you have to pick the right shoes for the right terrain. This is sort of 
hiking boot on the right that, yeah, that's by a wonderful company called Danner. Of course, the sort of all-purpose you know, the Red Wing, uh, a moccasin with with uh, with this uh, with this tread. Scarpa. These are approach shoes that are used in rock climbing, but they're also uh, nice for hiking. And these on the left, of course, if you find yourself in terrain that might be infested by reptiles, like I did when I was at Joshua Tree a couple of years ago, and ran into a giant rattlesnake. These things are very useful. So. Um, Headgear, of course, you want to protect yourself from the sun. And, uh, you know, you, everybody's concerned about UV protection. And you want uh, actually headgear that, that, is, that is UV safe, not just a ball cap, but, but something that is able to put your whole head into shadow. So this is, this is a Filson, like waxed cotton hat, the wonderful company. This is by Tilly on the bottom, uh, which is a Canadian outfit. Um, and these are travel vests, which have loads of pockets in them. And actually, that's really all you need to carry your materials. And if anybody's been to Italy and you've been to, you know, the market, the, the like, biweekly street markets, there's always um, um, somebody selling Jockey di Viaggi, you know, these these like travel vests and uh, they're pretty easy to find. Um, you know, this, this Orvis, this is one that I have, this Orvis, I've got a bunch of them. So anyway, you want, you want something also to carry your kit in. So I, I, I know some people like to carry a backpack, but if I'm just going painting, I don't, I don't carry a backpack. It's overkill. So uh, this is a shoulder bag from Filson. Of course, they're very pricey, but they'll outlive you. It's terrific gear. It's, um, it's you know, probably the best on the market, at least made in the U.S. And this is uh, by a company called, like, Right in the, right in the Rain, which, uh, which offers a whole range of, uh, of, uh, like satchels and containers and so forth and so on. And this is something that you can actually mount on your belt. And it's large enough to carry a sketchbook and a watercolor box and a couple of portable brushes, a couple of pens. And of course the, the Orvis, uh, you know, like a cross body bag is a fishing bag, but um, <clears throat> works also to carry your art materials. And of course, your personal needs, sunscreen, an absolute must, water, absolute must, and to keep hydrated, uh, and, and insect repellent because Lyme disease is, is an ever-present West Nile virus. All these things are out there now, so you want to really be careful. And uh, of course, eye protection, UV protection for your eyes, good sunglasses, not cheap sunglasses, get some good sunglasses and some kind of a multi-tool um, is always handy. This is a Leatherman I or Gerber, I, I don't know which, but uh, either company makes them and they're well worth having, Leatherman or Gerber. Uh, you may find a log or a stump to sit on if you're going to be there for a while, but I think probably it's wiser to invest in some kind of seating, uh, portable seat that you can carry with you that will be light and uh, uh, won't get in the way. On the left, um, you see a, a traditional tripod stool. This kind of thing has been in use since antiquity, since you know, the Greek and Roman days a piece of leather and three sticks. And this is made by a company called Wood and Falk, F-A-U-L-K. Uh, the one next to it, just to the right, is by a company called Walkstool, which is a Swedish company. And it collapses and uh, can be carried in a net bag. It has a, like a shoulder strap, very, very light, very strong. Um, uh, I actually, when I do my 
Zoom workshops in the field, that's the stool I'm using. And of course, if you go to Dick's or any Hunter's Supply angling shop, they've got stools. Of course, you know, camouflage uh, would tell you that. And of course, you know, the British style shooting sticks, which are a combination of a walking stick and a seat that uh, kind of open up uh, with a leather strap that you can sit on. And there's a, as you can see, there's a spike at the bottom and a disc so that that goes into the ground and the handles go out to the sides and then you have uh, a seat. But I recommend this one here, the walk stool. Although I like, I, you know, I like the, I like the shooting stick as an idea. Okay, so tools. Uh, any questions about gear in the chat? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. Um, yeah, and if anyone does have a question, you know, as as James is talking, please do put it in the chat. There was a question about insects, if they were more prevalent in the Catskills or the Adirondacks, but well, I think the, probably what do you both, say? Both. I think I think the Adirondacks are notorious for uh, and also Maine and the North Country, New Hampshire, Vermont, for thing, things called black flies, yeah. Yeah. which in Ireland are called midges. They're these little, you know, and they swarm thousands of them. And some of them are a little bitey. So uh, you want to make sure that you're, you're unapp as unappetizing to them as possible. And that's what the insect repellent is for. But they're usually seasonal, you know, so you're not going to worry about um, killer bees or mostly it's mosquitoes and black flies you need to worry about. And, you know, if, if you're out in, um, in an area where there, there is a heavy concentration, when you get your hat, why not also invest in just a net over your, you know, over the hat? Uh, and over your head to protect at least your face. Um, I forgot to say this too about the clothing. I, I know that you know that people like to go hiking in sort of attractive sports gear and yoga pants and whatever. And when I was at Joshua Tree and ran into the uh, Southern Pacific rattlesnake. There were people like walking around flip flops and halter tops and flimsy clothing, unbelievable. I think you know, it's just know where you are, dress appropriate, appropriately for the environment. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I was astonished that not more people get, you know, injured by snakes and other things out there. But actually, what what the ranger told me was that people like lose a lot of pets if they're not on a leash because they encounter one of these critters and yeah. and uh it's it's a rather serious thing if you get a, if you if you have a bite from one of those because they have th three toxins and you'll probably die if you don't get treatment so okay so uh, um you know james there are a lot of questions in the chat about um types of paint, watercolors, papers, things like that. Here we and, go. Um, that's what we're getting to now, right? That's right. Okay, here we go. Okay, oh, so I, I'm going to I'm going to unpack my own personal practice because uh, th this is something that's evolved over the years and so I figure why bring you through the whole the whole painful ordeal. I'll just un unpack what I'm doing now. So, uh Often I will use like micron pens uh, for the drawing elements, for like laying out the composition. I typically begin with the lightest color that's legible, which is orange in this, in this brand of pen. And uh, of course you can see here, uh, here are the pens and the lines they make. Uh, Sakura micron. And then these are travel brushes. They, they come in all sorts of sizes and shapes. And I have some here I'll show you actually on the work surface uh, in a minute. And then um, you want some kind of pencil, some kind of drawing implement. Uh, 
And this on the right is a Coeco, which is an Austrian company that makes these wonderful uh, fine like writing instruments that, that are also extremely durable. And so here we've got the Coeco pencil, the mechanical pencil, and on the bottom, the sport fountain pen. I've got both here and we'll show you in a minute. Uh, here we have watercolor travel sets. Uh, I like these core watercolors, which are from Golden Paints. Of course, Windsor Newton's traditional. It's very hard to get these half pans anymore in America. Uh, if you go to Kremer, K-R-E-M-E-R -E -E in New York, or Cornelison in London, it's a good place to get these. You can order them online. A place called Cornelison, C-O-R-N-E-L. L-I-S-E-N, I believe, in London, next to the British Museum, the great website, and Kremer, K-R-E-M-E-R, -E -E in New York and Germany. So, but these, these core watercolor sets, uh, you know, colors are really intense and really durable. And this one on the left, the Cotman, is sort of basically a beginner, like, you know, the kitty watercolor travel book, the sort of student grade, they used to say. And uh, if you've already got pans, you could order a tin from an outfit called Whiskey Painters. As for substrates, I recommend um, Moleskin watercolor books. Um, also, you know, Linden travel journals or the Sennelier, like linen sketchbooks. Also, uh, Arches makes a wonderful watercolor block that um, is, uh, has a kind of panoramic uh, aspect. And, uh, and this is really just almost exactly the same size as the, you know, the Moleskin book open. It's just not a diptych, it's, it's just one, one uh, sheet, but very portable. So as you can see, this is my setup in the middle with the bag, the stool, a little portable table available in a lot of camping stores, all, all kinds of brands, you know, my book, my paints, my brushes. And here you can see me, I'm at, actually, it's at Mount Greylock uh, in the Berkshires. And I've got the stool over my shoulder, I've got a bag uh, also over my shoulder, a walking stick. Um, you know, the whole idea is to develop a portable mobile practice and follow the ethos of carry in, carry out, and leave no trace. And that's important because it's not just about making art and improving yourself. It's also about leaving things as you find them and respecting nature and uh, not contributing to its uh, vexations. Uh, James, there was a question about the folding table. If you use that um, only sometimes, or if it's a it's a part of your gear, a regular part of your gear. Uh, it's it's not a regular part of my gear, which 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 is why I didn't include it in in, in you know, materials. But there are many different brands you can find uh, that basically it's 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 a it's a roll up tabletop and it's got a collapsible frame. And, uh, you know, if you go to any camping supply store, you'll find something like that. And uh, uh, it's just another thing to carry. And I, I wanna carry as little as possible. I wanna be as mobile and portable <coughs> as I can. And, and having to carry a table is, <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, you know, just another burden. So uh, <clears throat> I can send uh, everybody the uh, the brand if they're interested. So <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> I need to get a drink of water. So let's uh, let's take a quick break and. Let's really come back in two minutes and I'll show you a few things. On sure, sounds good. 
Right. Um, and just so that everyone knows, I have pasted the link to the web page that uh, James has <coughs> for us that has all of these uh, tools and supplies uh, linked in right. the web page so that for your convenience. So if anybody right. wants to hang around and, and ask some questions, feel free. But uh, okay. Um, go grab a drink and right. Uh, setting, setting my alarm for two minutes. Um, we have had a few questions in the chat about when this recording will be available. So if everybody wants to know, I can paste the uh, YouTube channel link into the chat for everyone. Um, it'll be found on our YouTube channel. Um, you can go find if you know you don't have the link, um, you can go into YouTube and just type in Hudson River Museum and the link should be easy to, uh, the channel should be easy to find. Um, and hopefully this video will be posted sometime later this week. Um, and I can also send out an email to um, uh, all of the registrants for this program as well. So that in mind. Thank and, you. Uh, yes, and James, uh, the floor is yours again. Okay, good. Well, let me, let me, uh, I gotta do one thing here to. Okay, well, while James is setting up, um, I'm also going to put in the chat the dates of um, all the subsequent sessions um, that James is going to be conducting. Uh, the next one is going to be next uh, next week at 1.30 on Wednesday, and then there will be one in June, one in July, and one in August. So um, take a look in the chat for those dates. We'd love to have you whenever you can come for all or some. Thanks. Okay, I think we can. Uh... So anyway, um, briefly, I'm going to show you a few things uh, uh, that hopefully will help uh, help you connect the dots with um, a number of the slides I showed in the PowerPoint. So here we go. So just to begin, um, this is uh, the kind of sketchbook that um, I recommend. You know, it's pocket-sized. It's the same size as a mobile phone. And, and uh, I want to make a point of calling that to your attention. Because this is another kind of mobile handheld device. Going over there. Uh, just to show you an example of, of what some of the finished works look like. This is one of my sketchbooks. So this would, you know, this. Really see that? So this, this is, <coughs> this is the way that I work. I'm not saying that everybody has to work that way. <coughs> you don't have to cover every page. Some people ask me, why do you paint on both sides? What if you want to cut up the book? Well, I don't want to cut up the book. That's the whole point. I want to confound people who want to cut up books. So, you know, this, this really kind of is my canvas. 
And uh, so we'll start with this and work our way backwards. This is binding. So here is, um, give you an idea what that looks like. This is a, uh, an enameled metal pen. It's very small. I could put it in my pocket, you know, and uh, so it's <clears throat> extremely portable. And this is an example of a travel brush. I've got a few here, which I can share. There are two kinds mostly. One is a is a is like a brass barrel. The other one is sort of a a plastic uh, screw top. This simply comes apart like this. You put one end into the tube. Let me back up a little bit. Whoops. No. There we go. So you can see this is this is the brush, and then it just simply goes back the wet it so it comes to a point and just simply whereas this is another this is a Da Vinci brand. Try to zoom in on that. It opens up like this and it screws <coughs> into the handle. <coughs> so there are your two common options. And some of the brands uh, that are available, like for instance, this is a very, the very high end called Escoda. Uh, these are, you know, this will cost you a couple hundred bucks for this, but you can find if you go to Blick or Utrecht, they've got much, much cheaper options. All right. So as far as writing implements go, you have here your, your standard, like a technical pencil that, you know, has a graphite, has you know, uh, at the bug, at the back has a release button and uh, 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 contains a stick of graphite. Uh, also, another option, as I explained before, were these. This is the Coeco pen, the fountain pen, which you can see is is uh, I mean, very durable. It's it's sort of. Full disclosure, unfortunately, this, this was invented by the same people who gave us the Volkswagen, but uh, we'll try not to hold it against them. It's a wonderful pen, but it's, it's the kind of thing that you can, you know, write with. Problem is with fountain pen ink is uh, that um, it runs and bleeds. So if you're planning to go over it with a wash or with watercolor, the ink is going to get into the uh, into the painting, and so that's why I prefer using uh, you know the micron pens like these. And uh, here we have a very preliminary sketch with a micron pen. Here's another Coeco, little tiny one. It's like a piece of machinery, but it's utterly indestructible. So if you're hiking and uh, you know there's a chance you could fall on a rock or something, you might break. If you're carrying a Mont Blanc ambassador, you're out a thousand bucks. With this, you're this is maybe a hundred dollars and last forever. 
So um, here we have a preliminary drawing with a, a, a micron pen. I'll show you also a couple of the demo drawings I did for other uh, workshops. Like this was a, a this was a, an analysis of Thomas Cole's oxbow using quadrants and thirds, and we spoke about mapping it all out. And then here too, another uh, page spread where, you know, I recommended make a map of where you are, try to understand the terrain that you're looking at. And then here, uh, mapping it out and, and using warm and cool color just to establish the image. So, <clears throat> um, Now we've seen the brushes, we've seen the pens, we've seen uh, everything except uh, paint. So I think that if we want to get started, you, you could just like lay out your image and I will be talking about how to do this. I mean, there are a variety of ways to do this. And uh, you know, the method that I recommend is not just simply copying shapes, but is actually trying to measure the space and you know be mindful of quadrants and thirds of of the hidden armature of the blank page and so as you can see i can just simply take this and just you know lay in color quickly and you know, like if you look at the work of Turner, for instance, he's very, it's very fast. You know, he's not, he's not worried about making mistakes. And this is the other thing I think when you're drawing, you don't want to see anything that you do as a mistake. Everything you put on the page is a decision. And in, in my opinion, none of it should be erased because when you do that what you're doing is your is your um uh, your um uh, you're you're actually uh, uh committing an act of amnesia you're forgetting what you did is you are you going to be able to go back and actually remember recall what your thinking was you know so at this point I might start a painting like this just by taking a few notes, you know, and just by laying a, a few color accents down in primary colors and using warm and cool as my light and dark and maybe using the red as a half tone because it is after all sort of a middle value. So this is my Mont Saint Victoire. This is you know, Camel Hump Mountain, Vermont. And just you know, it it begins like this. It doesn't need to be. <clears throat> um, doesn't need to be picky. It doesn't need to be perfect. You're just responding to to the experience of looking and and the goal is to teach yourself what you behold as the late andrew forge said the dean of the school of art at yale he said if you want to know something first draw it if you really want to understand what you're looking at you have to draw it because the act of drawing is going to force you to pay attention to things in different ways than if you just look at it and try to memorize it without making a mark on the page. Making a mark on the page is going to write it onto the hard drive. And that at this point is more important than making a successful painting. If you can create a successful memory or you're able to produce a uh, new knowledge or you're able to form an idea as a result of the experience and that's more valuable than than um than a prize-winning picture at this point 
And besides, that's not an option for everybody. So why exclude anybody? Anybody can benefit from this practice. Any questions? So James, we did have a couple of very specific questions. <laughs> um, one is what kind of water container do you use? Is there anything in particular? Uh, well, you can use you can use anything. I mean, there is a uh, the Windsor Newton travel set that I showed actually has a little flask. Oh, it it it's it's a little and and then there's a cup the the you know, it opens up. Um, I don't have one right here with me, but uh, it opens up the the uh, you know the piece that holds the two halves together it's hinged is the cup and then there's a flask um, that's part of it it's a Windsor Newton travel set and then there's another kind of tinned enamel tin that has a flask uh, you know at the bottom it's like this only um, it's like this except here there's a little flask Anyway, if you go on whiskey painters, you can see those. And and actually, a related question was who's uh, from Nancy. She asked, uh, whose color pan set are you using? Uh, I think these are Sennelier, but you know what? I'm not. I, I'm my my uh, my like watercolor. Uh, habits are rather promiscuous i i like every brand so so i might use schminka i might use sennelier i might use windsor newton lately i really like the golden uh acrylics core watercolor which is not really which is not acrylic but it's a new resin in place of uh, the gum arabic and the colors are very intense. It's a really, it's a really great product. And core is spelled Q O R. Q O R. Okay. But my Mary is also terrific. It's an Italian company, and they've got multiple grades: M I M A I M E R I, uh, Sennelier, which is of course the you know the Parisian, um, you know, a, 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 you know, a color company that special is famous for pastels and watercolor and um, Windsor Newton. But I think you can buy them all through uh, 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 you know, the Cornellisons in London or uh, any of the fine uh, art material stores in the US. Unfortunately, in New York, everything's gone to Blick. But you know, if you go to Denver, there's miningers and uh, I mean, all over the country, there's still you know, art supply stores that are, are uh, that uh, cover, um, the, you know, that offer a range of brands. But like I said, my favorites are, are apart from the core watercolors by Golden Paints, is the Sennelier, the Schmincke, Windsor Newton, and my Mary. And so my favorite. Art supply store is Cornellison's in London, which has a great website. Cornellison's is that in your um, in your yeah. document? Okay, it's in the supply list. Okay, that's that's great. I I do want to point out it's a little bit after three. Um, well, we, we can. Have... Well, why don't we unmute people if they want to hang yeah. around and just talk? So. I think that would be great. We did have some questions, uh, specific questions about the weight of paper and different kinds of paper. Sure. Uh, so um, it, can we unmute people, Olivia? And maybe if they could, um, yeah. uh, I don't know, do we want to raise hands or just uh, sort of take turns? What, would, what do you prefer, James? Just, just let, 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 just let's just have a roundtable discussion. Okay. All righty then. Um, so uh, Olivia will be unmuting everybody. So uh, yes, everybody now has the capability to unmute themselves if they right. should like. So if you would like to ask James a question, 
uh, please unmute yourself and he will respond. I, I want to give us maybe about what, about 10 minutes for this, James? We'll just see how it goes. Yeah. It's 10 or 15. Okay. Or, you know. 10, 15. So now's your chance. Yeah, this is just the beginning. This is just the preamble because the next time we're going to be, I'm going to be in the field and I'm, you know, it's going to be a whole other experience. We're going to be outdoors working uh, on the spot. Yeah, and pe people did have questions. I do want to let everybody know that I did put the subsequent um, sessions in the chat. They'll all be on Wednesdays at 1.30. They'll probably run about this long. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of conversation and give and take. Um, and, um, and James, if you would like maybe just to preface this by explaining a little bit about um, how you will be instructing and, um, you know, now that people have access to all of these wonderful uh, materials and then what the critique will be and, you know, how that's going to go just so people have a sense. Okay, just for starters, I'm going to, I'm going to put these PowerPoints up on my website in a blog post and then I will send that link to Olivia who can send it out to everybody. That Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, uh, how it's going to work is I'm going to probably do uh, a short, uh, like, you know, like a 10 minute a PowerPoint talk. I'm going to talk about where we are, what we're going to be doing. I'm going to try to make it progressive. So I'm going to start with the first one will be uh, like laying out a composition and working on grisaille with you know, you know, black and white or working in a, a monochromatic palette. I don't want to get into color right away, but just, you know, talking about uh, seeing the page and then seeing what we're looking at uh, around us or the motif as, as it were. I mean, this is the thing I used to tell students all the time when I was teaching life drawing is especially a beginner, I would ask them, what's the biggest thing in your drawing? And they would invariably say the model. And I would say, you're wrong. The biggest thing in your drawing is the page. The first thing you have to see is the page. So that space, it's like, you know, when somebody studies acting, they have to learn how to walk across the stage, how to own their space. It's the same thing with painting. You got to own your space. You know, you got to figure that out somehow. Otherwise, you're going to be lost in the process. You're just going to be copying what you're looking at. You're not going to get much out of it. Okay. So, questions. Yeah, questions. Yes. Hi. Go, go for it. Um, uh, hi. Um, my name's Nancy. Um, I have a um, panorama book um, uh, with me, and oh, it's um, Pentalic. And um, I, uh, I find that it, it, it absorbs the watercolor too much. I use Arches 140 um, uh, cold press um, and I love the way I can move uh, the pigment um, across the paper. But when I'm outdoors, I'm dealing with, you know, wind and dry air. Right. Um, uh, so uh, I, I don't have that freedom. I feel I don't have that freedom of, you know, the being able to move the color as much. So I was wondering if you could recommend, you know, maybe a, a brand that was more forgiving. Well, I, I, I think, I think, like I said, I think the moleskin watercolor books are fine. They're adequate. And the other thing too, is I think that watercolor can be glazed and you can work, you can build it up. A lot of people are taught watercolor as this sort of premier coup, one shot, you know, technique, the sort of John Singer Sargent. But in fact, if you look at the historic artists like Sanby or John White or any of those people, they're building up glazes. And that's, that's that just, <laughs> that you need to learn through practice and through having somebody explain it to you. And I'll do that uh, in the weeks to come. But um, it, it has to do with how you, load the brush and how you empty the color onto the page without actually scrubbing what's underneath. It's just a matter of finesse and, and it can only be acquired through practice. But yeah, I think 
you know, like paper texture, paper weight, paper brand, they're all different, whether you go with the Arches or Fabriano or Hanamula or whatever, you know, they're all, they're all different or Strathmore, you know, and you just have to figure out what works for you. Yeah, I'm going to experiment and try another uh, brand. Yeah, why don't you, um, yeah, I would try the moleskin books or the handbooks or, or just maybe bring out a little watercolor block like the Arches watercolor block, you know, panoramic. That's um, uh, uh, very true. But I, I love I love working. You know, I, I was inspired by uh, your exhibit. Thank you. Well, I I, I want to like I remind Olivia that like one of our are you there, Olivia? Olivia? Yes, yes yeah. I'm here. Okay. Uh, we want to encourage people to send scans of their work to the museum, don't we? So if you do, if yes. as, as, as a result of any of these workshops, we really invite you to send us either just a photograph or if you have a scanner, just send us images of what you're doing that relate to this course. So for instance, if as a result of this talk today, you go out and you make a sketch in the field, send it to me or to Olivia. Um, yes, and I've provided my email in the chat. Right. Um, it's ocipriano at hrm.org. You can also send it to programs at hrm.org. Um, I'm most likely to find it though at ocipriano. Or, or you can just send it to me at workshops at needlewatcher.com. So, and you can share that email maybe in the chat, Olivia. And then, so that one way or another, however you want to, how, however you want the work to, however you want your work to reach us, I mean, we'd be glad to, uh, we'd be glad to use it. Please, please indicate if you have any hesitations about us sharing it yeah because because otherwise you know we we would love to to be telling stories right on social media about about this experience yeah and, so you know, you know, highlight your work yeah we'll highlight your work and uh you know i mean this is really i mean i imagine this whole series as being kind of a big conversation with a bunch of my colleagues and friends new friends and old and uh uh so send us images any other questions? Thank you. Um, I have a question, uh, Mr. James. Um, I mentioned that I do abstracts from now on. So I'm <coughs> traveling. I'll be able to attend maybe the last session for the critique. Um, can I still submit, say, if I was in a museum and I've been able to uh, do a little watercolor sketch or if I'm sitting at home doing um, uh, watercolor sure. landscape, sure. but just abstract. Sure. Look, the thing is, as I said before, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really concerned about style. I mean, if you think about somebody mm -hmm. like the late Richard Diebenkorn, mm -hmm. you know, he was a landscape painter who worked in an abstract style. If you think about somebody like John Walker, you know, he's an abstract painter who goes back and forth from from imagery to abstraction but he's a land he's a landscape painter i remember when i studied under him at yale you know he spoke all the time about constable and uh it was a huge influence on his work but it's like it's not about style for me it's not about style and i don't want to i don't want to leave anyone out of the conversation because of um of some kind of allegiance to style. I think that's a 20th century mindset. And I think we're okay. well past that, so. Wonderful. Uh, now, Thank James, um, I'm sorry, there, just one other clarification. For the final critique <coughs> though, um, we will be asking people to submit to it through a Dropbox, correct? Yeah, we got a Dropbox. Um, and I guess the thing to do would be to reach out to um, uh olivia and <clears throat> she will um she will receive the images that you want to uh to have in the critique 
and and then we will construct a PowerPoint and then we will talk about the images in that format. Yes, I just ask that when you send your images to me, please make sure you give me um, your name and uh, you know maybe if you want to put a date, but just your name for the most part is uh, the most helpful, <laughs> so we know who we're talking to when we review these. Yeah. So these these are the final submissions, not the ones that you send in the course of, of, of over the five sessions, just to show your, your involvement and your progress. So. Uh, yeah, I, wanna, I want everybody to think about the work, the work they're gonna do in relationship to this course as being, uh, you know, part of a conversation, part of a dialogue. It's not, you know, we're not here to learn how to make a certain kind of art. We're here to learn how to, how to become more, how, how to become keener observers and how to become more mindful of our surroundings, and uh, and and hopefully in ways that promote environmental awareness and ecological civics and and historic preservation, things like that. But but Thanks. yeah. Any other questions? Gail Gail has yeah. raised her hand. Yes, um, I've registered for this session. Are we automatically registered for the other four? No, no. So, Go ahead, Olivia. Go ahead. so um, if you visit our website, um, you can see that the one for May 19th is already up on the calendar. Um, and about two weeks out before each program, they will be posted on our calendar with a registration link where you can sign up just like you did today and you will receive those uh, Zoom links <laughs> to join us in these programs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ronan has a hand raised. Uh, yes. Hello. Thank you so much. This was really great. Uh, I had a couple of questions regarding equipment because uh, I use a watercolor. Well, there used to be a store called AI Friedman, and also there was a, the Lee's Art Store on 57th. Both shut right. down. Both uh, closed, yeah. yeah. Badly. Uh, I was wondering if you think Strathmore paper is good or if you recommend something else? Or if you recommend to have a canvas or a book, what's better, best for kind of travel painting? Well, Ronan, I, th I think that uh, for the sake of mobility, uh, I think, <clears throat> you know, a book or a small watercolor block is preferable because I think, you know, once, once you're dealing with canvas, that means you're dealing with stretchers, that means you're dealing with, uh, with like a dimensional object, that means you're, You've also got something that's textile and things can go through it. And if you're painting with oil, then things can get stuck in it. I mean, you're welcome to do that, but I think that um, it, 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 it requires a little bit more uh, logistical uh, effort to work uh, uh, with those kind of materials. As far as Strathmore is concerned, yeah, I think, you know, what you're looking for is an acid-free or pH neutral rag paper. And that, that, you know, each brand has its own, it uses its own blotters and rollers. It has its own kind of textures. It has its own kind of sizing. Um, there's a great company in Canada. I think it's in Montreal called Canal and they make this wonderful these wonderful panoramic, large panoramic pads. Um, I know, I just think you have to try uh, different substrates with different materials and see what works best for you. I see. And then, because also uh, I had taken some art classes and we, we really ma mainly use kind of Statler and Faber Castell and Prisma color. I'm not sure with paints uh exactly where to go or if those are good to well, use. well i'm going to be talking about that i mean i think with what with with you know the watercolor you want to get the best you can afford um because the pigments will have more uh you know will will have higher uh you know a tinting power and be less fugitive um <clears throat> um as far as markers we talked about uh, like statler and pentel and so forth those, those are like mark making tools, right? Like the Micron pens. I, I mean, I use the Micron pens, it's Micron, uh, the, you know, Micron pen, um, am I on, where am I? You know, the Micron pen 
uh, is, um, um, you know, a linear tool, whereas the Statler and Pentel have what, different kinds of points that can, that can uh, imitate a brush. I mean, another thing, if you're working in the black and white is just go get a Japanese writing pen, like a sumi pen, uh, you know, kanji writing pen. And that's, uh, you know, the tip instead of being a steel tip, like a fountain pen, Western fountain pen is a brush. But uh, I would just experiment with whatever and it just, you know, it keeps evolving. Um, thank yeah, you. also, because there's the Faber-Castell uh, calligraphy brush pen as well. Yeah, they're great. But, but I see it with my approach and I'm not trying to get people to do like what I do. Um, I'm just trying to unpack these ideas uh, in, in the hopes that each person might find their own, their own path. They might uh, learn something from what my example that inspires them to go, uh, you know, to, to, to go and to develop their own method but um, I think of the, of the drawing element, the linear element as being sort of the rational side of the drawing process or the painting process. I think about the color as being the more sensate uh, uh, phenomenal kind of emotional side of the process. So it's this, dialectic between sort of line and color. Like Matisse said, um, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, um, you know, line, uh, the, you know, drawing is to the mind what, what, what color is to the senses or something like that. You know, and so. Thanks, um, James. Thank you. I think Linda has a question. Linda? Th and thank you, Ronan, for your questions. Linda, you're up, but you need to um, unmute yourself. Unmute. You there? How, how's that? You That's can hear good. me now. Perfect. You got it. We're on. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Um, yeah, you had mentioned um, going over the work, you know, with working in, in um, glazes and so forth. And another technique that, that I often enjoy using is, is coming back and using the combination of gouache with the watercolor. Is that something you have recommendations for, for gouache? I mean, should I just get another? Um, no, I think that that <clears throat> that's an option. It's just as a different. It requires you to make different decisions because with gouache, you can't really you can't really build because when you lay a gouache mark over another gouache mark, what happens is you get this outline, and so you don't. You know, so th that's the thing you, you, you that you do at the very, very end. Yeah. Let's say if you're if you're like looking at your painting and it's a watercolor painting and it's been built up in glazes, and you want to add that other dimension of contrast, which is opacity against the transparency. You know, you see this in old master paintings all the time when they have some, in, like Rembrandt's nose. You know, some impasto or something that's really what you know or constable with with his you know impostos that that's really what gouache is for unless you're doing the entire thing in gouache and then i think you know the way to approach it is sort of like a fairfield porter painting a kind of like a one shot um you know like premier coup you know, you know you're not going to build it in the same way But it's fine. I mean, the watercolor, I mean, uh, just as I have no, um, you know, dog in the fight when it comes to um, polemics of style or technique, um, um, I, 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 yeah, I don't really feel any like loyalty to watercolor or I mean, I use colored pencils, I use watercolor, I use gouache, I use acrylic, I use anything that works, you know, so. But as, a, as a technique for, um, you know, in, in the context of, you know, the goal with portability is, is adding the, the 
the gouache, something that you would do later on in the studio after your bath? I could only, I, yeah, probably it would be something I would do back at the campsite or the hotel as I'm enjoying a, a glass of single malt and tickling <laughs> my work of the day. Yeah, I might maybe maybe do that. But I would only use gouache with lighter colors because um, the darker colors uh, gain a lot by the transparency created through glazing. So, And this is the other thing too, is that what you do in the field when you're actually out in the field, you know, everything's changing. The light is changing. You know, you, you, you could have rain and sunshine. You could have uh, you know, in, encounters with wildlife or insects or unwelcome human visitors or whatever, you know. So, <clears throat> you know, when you're out in the field, you're subject to um, circumstances over which you have no control. And uh, so the, the part of the practice is like coming back and like looking at what you've done, maybe connecting the dots if you weren't able to finish a thought in the field, you can always do that later at home or in your studio. Thanks. Oh, James, I just, um, I see that it's almost 3.30. You wow. must be, you must be exhausted. It's been almost two hours. I want to, I want to thank everyone for your questions. I, uh, there, one, one last question that Ronan had was about where to paint. Um, you know, so long as you can receive the Zoom, so long as you can get on Zoom, you could be situated wherever you like, uh, assuming the weather is permitting. You could be inside, you could be outside, right. you know, situated in front of an incredible view or just looking out your window. That is completely up to you. So, um, James, do you have any last, uh, do we have any more hands up, Olivia? I just don't wanna cut anybody off. I, um, not that I can uh, currently see. Okay, all right, I great. Would say to, I would say to Ronan that if he's, um, if he's in the Mid-Hudson Valley region ever, which he may be, um, that I think Olana is a wonderful place with terrific vistas. I think also North South Lake and the site of the Catskill Mountain House near Haynes Falls across the river is a terrific site. I think also if you go to the Berkshires, there's a, I think it's called Mount Washington State Park, Bish mm -hmm. Bash Falls is a terrific motif. There are plenty of them and I would invite Ronan to reach out to me privately and I'm glad to share any insights that I have so thank you James thank you all so much for being here any any last words of wisdom before we we call it an afternoon and uh, look forward to next week